Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Nick Matthews, and my colleagues at Les Mead, Nick Mountford. Um, separated at birth, only our mothers can tell us apart. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about induction welding and what we've been doing to develop that, what it is. And then I'm going to hand over to Nick, and Nick's going to give you an insight as an SME about trying to break into the rail industry as a total outsider, no experience of rail whatsoever. And then I'm going to close up with how I see innovation in network rail panning out. So, so, um, so what we're going to go through what induction welding is. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the testing and validation of the induction welding in the plant. Then we're going to talk about these barriers to innovation and some possible solutions. So what we wanted to do was um, find a way of welding S and C um, with a solid phase weld. So a solid phase weld, most people probably know as a flashbook weld or similar. The problem with a flashbook weld when it comes to S and C is it consumes rail. It consumes about 28 to 30 mil of rail. Now when you've got the tight geometry of S and C and pre curved panels and you start consuming rail at that rate, it's not long until your S and C, your toe to nose dimensions and all that sort of stuff is out of kilter. So we needed the, the advantages of a, a flashbook weld, but with the properties, the benefits of a thermic weld, i.e. not consuming rail. So we went around the houses and we came up with induction welding. Um, so that's what we had to do. And the objective we set ourselves really was, if you look at that picture, the top is a piece of rail which we bent, and the bottom is a piece of rail we bent with a bend tester with an induction weld, and we wanted to get the exact same properties we see in rail as, as we do with welded. If that was a thermic weld, that would have break to 80 tons of pressure, and it would, you know, it would not bend like a banana like that. So how did we get to where we are? So we're currently at um, rail industry ready re re level six, which basically means we've got, we got the concept proven in a factory environment. So we started off with the test bench, which you can see at the top of the corner, uh, top, top of the picture, sorry. Um, that took us to rail industry level five, i.e. sort of proof of concept. Um, we then basically did a factory demonstration uh, rail industry level five, where we did all the sort of fatigue testing, bend testing to show that we had a really, really good weld. And then we went out to um, grain sidings and actually deployed the head on an interface skid where we really want to get to is that being an RRV attachment. And then this is where we basically came across some problems where we currently are at the moment. We're getting reliability because in a factory we're welding like one or two meters of rail. But when we started doing it in the field, obviously in sleepers, big long strings, we then found we had some structural problems with the head um, which needs strengthening. And this is with COVID and a few other things, literally the project ran out of money. So we're currently trying to refinance the project to move forward. Um, so that's where we are. So we've got a video to play so you can see what induction welding does. I think actually, Nick, do you want to talk over this one? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's on. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll play the, uh, the video now if that's okay. So this is a, a piece of equipment we designed and built for Network Rail to demonstrate the, the process in a, in a prototype environment.
Yeah, so um, that, that's uh, basically induction welding. And, um, for the eagle-eyed of you, the reason we can use it in SNC or plan to use it in SNC is because it's a static process. We can actually put a sacrificial insert, a rail, to account for the rail consumption. Um, and that, but it mainly is because it's a static process, we can actually do that. So, um, a little bit where we are technically on induction welding. So, we're 56. Um, basically, all the bend tests are done, all the fatigue testing is done, and basically, um, the mean strength is um, 275, and that is way in excess of um, flashbot welding. And on the bend testing, you saw the bend test at the end. Um, a Fermit weld normally fails about 80, 85 tons. We're in, in excess of 135 tons of pressure before that weld breaks. It's um, quite phenomenal. And um, for those sort of interested at the bottom, that's some of the um, sort of macros of the um, thing. And it's a little bit hard to see, but on the induction weld, um, the, on the other sort of weld, the white lines is literally where the, the rails are joining. Uh, on the induction weld, you've got two really thin white lines. That just shows, effectively, the high quality of the welds we're producing. And uh, just a little bit more on the test results. So what, what the top graph is showing, what well, all the graphs is showing, is actually when we talked about how this mirrors plain rail, um, the induction weld is mirroring that. In fact, it's a little bit harder, which is not such a bad thing. So um, the head we developed, um, the, the option for it, we want it to be fairly lightweight so we can place it on an RRV. Um, so, and rather than having a dedicated RRV like the Flashbot welders, it's an attachment. So that really brings the operational costs down. Um, obviously, things like stressing and peaking, we're going to build in. It's all, all doable. Um, and um, yeah, basically, we want to try and error proof the welding process. So the head goes down. We don't have to get our hands in there feeling if it's all aligned, the head does it all for us. And basically, we, we're not going to get quite the speed of a flashbot weld, which is about two minutes, but the heating process is seven minutes, which again, when you compare to a Fermit weld, is pretty rapid. So again, um, so it's just a few of the benefits. So significant safety benefits, no gas bottles, no manual handling, you know, um, no people on their hands and knees doing fermit welding. Environmental benefits, um, massive reduction in power compared to a, a flashbot welder. Flashbot welders, 750, 800 kilowatts of power. We're down to about 45 kilowatts of power. So again, that means the generator and stuff we need to power this is significantly less. That also lends itself quite nicely to being an attachment as opposed to a dedicated machine. Um, modular design, so, you know, for example, if we wanted to put it, I don't know, take the banks out of a tamper and hang a head in the t instead of a tamper banks, potentially could do that. And the big thing for me from a track renewals point of view where I work is as I'm laying the track panels, the S&C panels, I can be welding while the Kirov train or whatever it is is going to get the next panel. So I can actually weld in the critical path and that is absolutely phenomenal. So um, I think probably already covered this, to be honest, but um, we're on hold, um, but why are we on hold? So we had some repeatability issues. We understand what, what caused the repeatability issues, but the initial head we built, we had to make some assumptions because no one's ever done this before. And some of those assumptions, such as the strength of the head, which we got it wrong, to be honest, and we got to learn from that, and we need to go and build a second head. Um, but again, it's like anything, that costs money. We've got to pay people like Mirage to do this. So I'm currently talking to the Network Rail and the R&D board is about how we can unlock some more money to take the lessons learned to date and build a second generation head. Um, and to do that, what we're going to do is we still need to prove, really, the uh, insert welds are, are viable. So what we're doing is working with the Manufacturing Technology Center in Coventry and we're building a finite model. We've already built it, but we're refining the finite model, which will then tell us exactly what the coil design, the induction coil, and that's the bit that really makes this work, sh should look like. And then we can go and put that on the test bench, test the finite model, and then hopefully that will give us then the confidence to actually say, yes, this actually works. 
and at that point then Network Rail hopefully will unlock the additional funding we then need to build the second head. So I think it's um, time to hand over to Nick. Thanks Nick. Um, breaking into a rail, we have very much new kids on the block if uh, that makes a lot of sense. We, we're predominantly a, an automotive manufacturer bes of, of bespoke machinery. Um, clients are typically sort of the Toyotas, Bentleys and, uh, and, and other automotive manufacturers. Um, and our background is building uh, equipment that um, particularly completes a process in typically three, 30 seconds or thereabouts uh, and integrates with a uh, poke yoke system, so error proof um, processing so that any process that's done is completed to the acceptable or standards uh, to hand on to the next process, uh, particularly for, uh, important in, in, in car manufacturing. We try to bring that kind of technology into uh, this project when we develop for, for network rail and I think we've, we've done a reasonable, uh, a reasonable attempt to do in that. So a bit of background about this, uh, typical sort of uh, our customers down the right hand side. Um, and w we've worked for a long time in the, with the Toyota production um, system where um, those processes are uh, indoctrinating into us as suppliers and they pretty much coach us to be the, the business that we are today. The process of uh, product acceptance, well, that felt like me early days with a, a great idea and an innovation and uh, very excited. But the process has been like a a Rubik's Cube that's a Braille one that you have to complete behind your back with a, a series of snakes and ladders along the way um, that we all have to l leap over. Um, but ultimately product acceptance is the goal for us. We're, we're committed to, to, to doing that and uh, you know, the, 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 the chances of, of not achieving that are, are realistic, but we, we address all those issues. Um, and it's, it's been a, a quite a, a difficult process. So some of the things we've had to do is, is to uh, uh, set ourselves up as um, um, and understand the rail network. And to access track, we've had to put our own people through all the training procedures, register ourselves as Sentinel, uh, and do all those kind of things. So um, my advice for anyone doing this pro kind of process is, is to build a very small scale um, approval test rig, which we, we did early days just to prove the process and start experimenting with the, uh, the, the parameters. So changing those things that might affect uh, the induction, um, induction heating process, which there are many, and, and it's easy to do it in a kind of lab environment or a workshop. So, uh, so we did that, that kind of worked, worked well. Um, Notice there that um, we needed to build a prototype, and that had gone to, to rail, and, and particularly with our project for, for, uh, for Network Rail, was um, we were given some parameters um, and probably compromised uh, the, the overall design, which is perhaps where we are today. Um, we, gave a, we had a, a maximum weight to deal with and a, and a minimum width so we could get into S and C. And a few other parameters there that really were probably a couple of steps too far. We'd have been better going to a, 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 a plain rail situation first. But um, the impetus was S and C and that, that was the focus we were given and, and where we drove the project. So the next thing was to, to, to produce 10, 10 uh, bend test samples, two for macros and 10 for T excess. And with our SEN56 process, as Nick mentioned earlier on, um, our, our bend strength, I think, I think it said in the video that we were about 100 kilonewtons above the 1330 pass mark. Um, we actually exceeded that significantly with, with typically a, a break would occur at about 1680. Um, and if it didn't break, then we, we'd, we'd have bought the test with a 50 mil bend. And our success rate on a non-breaking well is about 60%. Um, so, um, that was that was the the difficulties. Some of the some of the challenges of, of working on rail uh, were all new to us, um, and and in an absolutely totally different environment. Um, and then add into a a, a, a pandemic, and uh, and things things got even more difficult. So yeah, some of our our issues there were, were becoming um, serious members, our risk registration becoming a sentinel sponsor. And then um, DFR, that was, that was a challenge too. Um, and, and I think there was a, a lifetime's worth of work to, to even achieve DFR. Probably best left a, um, away from innovation actually and, and for sort of uh, high volume equipment rather than, than ours. Um, 
Financial challenges. Um, we're very, very grateful to have the financial support of Network Rail, which is there's no way we could have achieved it without them. Um, but the cost for us was significant. Um, we were on a, a fixed fee in our project. Um, those funds are spent long ago, and, and we're very much burning our own cash uh, as we continue to develop the process. Um, On-track support is very difficult to get, um, and without network rail support, it's almost impossible, as, as we can see, unless we, we start talking with um, heritage type railways. But those, those are other opportunities we are seeking at the moment. Um, geography, that adds a, a cost. If you're shipping your guys around the world, we were very fortunate at having Grange sidings uh, on our doorstep. Unfortunately, that facility is no longer with us, so we're, we're looking for a new site to go and weld rail on. So, and there we go, had a pandemic and some funding issues and it's all good fun. Um, way forward, I think a simplified route to um, innovation approval might be a stepping stone um, towards PA and, uh, and try and simplify that process. Um, there's certainly a lot of support that uh, that's needed for new people entering the rail industry. Um, and maybe, um, maybe there's a, a, a revamp or reconsideration of the PA process to try and engage and make it a little bit simpler to get good quality innovations that have got huge benefits into the rail infrastructure. I'll hand over to Nick on the, on the barriers, many thanks. Yeah, so uh, thanks Nick. So I'm going to talk about probably from the inside of Network Rail trying to get innovation moving forward. So. Um, I think the, probably the first lesson, and these are a lot of reflections on the induction welding project. What is the need? What is the pull? Are we assessing it correctly? Um, I think with the induction welding, I think Nick might have pointed on there. I think if the truth be known, we were trying to bite too much of the apple. And we should have tried and do a plain line machine first, then moved on to S&C. But the trouble is to get the funding from S&C to do something unique, R&D, we had to go for the difficult option, which was trying to weld S&C bit back to front and that just constantly constantly bites us um, and it's biting us now because I think if I'm honest Nick probably could turn out a plain line machine tomorrow from his factory but Network Rail doesn't want a plain line machine they want an S&C machine and that causes tension um, uh, hopefully we don't fall out too often about it Nick but um, there is tension there that's for true um, single tender actions is on there so I'm sure lots of people in this room have really, really innovative ideas. The trouble is, Network Rail being a public sector company, I have to go to a competitive tender, so I therefore am asking you to share all your ideas publicly, and people just don't want to do that. Where actually, with R&D, we are allowed single tender actions, just Network Rail don't really want to do it, but we need to move that so we can Companies can come to Network Rail with unique ideas and we can sort of back them. That's what I'd like to see, um, rather than having to always go to a competitive tender and then people are a little bit unwilling to share their ideas, understandably so. Uh, yeah, um, it's got, it's got go back one, Nick, sorry. Um, just, yeah, so, and, and there's a couple of other things on there. So, um, new technology, so what do we do? We get, oh, we need a standard. Oh, I'll tell you what, let's, dust off one of the standards we already have, which is wholly inappropriate for the new technology. Uh, so you end up almost trying to go backwards rather than forwards. So again, I think it's, it's we, we just need to let innovation happen, and then worry about, you know, worry about the standard afterwards. You know, go and test it in a safe environment, such as a sidings, a heritage railway, make sure it works, then write the standard around it rather than back to front. Um, and again, I, I, I think it's, there's a lack of understanding just generally. Um, someone mentioned earlier, we're relying on just buying off-the-shelf products. We're followers, we're not leaders. And um, the whole industry has been set up for that for quite a while. Um, and then when we do finally innovate, everyone expects it to be absolutely perfect out the, out the blocks. It's, it's a prototype, it's innovation. Actually, if it doesn't fail, actually, you've done something wrong. Because you, you need to fail, you need to learn from those mistakes to make it better. But having this expectation that it's always going to be good is not right. Um, and then the other one I'm not going to say too much about, I think everyone probably in this room is probably um, 
gone through the trial and acceptance process and the product acceptance process and yeah it's it, it really does need um and smartening up um so some of the solutions we tried to put in place for induction welding and i think works quite well is basically um, really got to get that clear understanding of what the product acceptance requirements are right at the start of the project um, because what we found with induction welding is as the technology developed the testing regime expected from network rail got harder and harder and it was like this ever moving goalpost and because the technology was significantly better than what was existing someone decided to then apply a more rigorous set of standards on us well actually we should be yeah we're producing a weld the weld has a performance function in the track and that's what we should be assessed to get um, again learning is nick is a uh, runs a successful business He's got no rail experience. He doesn't have a university attached to him, all that sort of stuff. So we really need to bring that consortium of brains together to innovate. So, you know, academia, the university, the Manufacturing Technology Centre, you need somebody with rail experience. So, um, you know, a, a non-track machine company you build a, to provide the SME that knowledge of the railway. And you, you, need, you, know, you need the smart people like Nick's company to do machine builders. But ultimately, you also need someone in network rail to be part of that or not network rail one of our one of our suppliers it doesn't have to be network rail but you need to, you need to come together as a consortium um and yeah and there's a few other things on there um but i think one of the big things really is it's getting network rail and our suppliers and such our contractors such as colas to actually work with the suppliers and help bring that innovation in into in, into the field because as Nick sort of suggested there, it's very hard to get rail access to test this equipment, um, and we, we really need to do something there. Um, but some of the results we've got by doing that is um, by working in collaboration, which we got to the wrong way around with the induction welding project, we come together and we have actually produced a welding machine. Yes, it's got faults, but we know what the faults are, but. Um, we got the manufacturing technology in, in Coventry to help us understand how induction welding works. Um, we got GOS Engineering to build us an interface skid just to keep the cost down. So we, we all came together. Then we got people like John Hemshall, Network Rail's uh, senior welding engineer, to actually start, you know, put the knowledge about welding rail. So we, we came together and, and, it, and it worked really. And also uh, having the, um, the constructors in there as well, i.e. the renewals part is going to use this. We got a deliverer's perspective, what it needs to look like as well, which again was a, a crucial part of it. Um, so yeah, so literally they're the lessons we need to learn. Um, you've got to have um, your stakeholders all lined up, um, really understand those, what those requirements are. Um, standards need to be developed as part of the R&D process, not applied ahead. Um, single tender action, I think would be, Nick, I think would be beneficial, to be honest. Um, and oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I don't know how many different panels I've had to go and sit in front of a network rail and explain what I'm trying to do. And every single one of those panels, SRP, track panel, R&D panel, the list could go on, all want to feed their 10 pennies worth into the innovation. What, we just we just need, yes, we need a system review panel, absolutely, but that's what we need. We don't need multiple panels all trying to steer us in different directions. And again, um, a can-do attitude is needed by all, not all oh, that won't work or what about this standard, we just can do. And finally, I think it's that why collaboration is needed. If we don't have a why collaboration, um, yeah, we're not going to attract SMEs in to come and help us. So thank you.